Fine. Let's 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 kick off then. So Viking Wirral after the the Battle of Brunebra, AD uh, nine three seven. So the uh, the Battle of uh, of, of, of Brunebra was a, a huge battle uh, fought in uh, Britain over a hundred years before the uh, the Battle of uh, of Hastings, and uh, it's been described as one of the the bloodiest of battles that have taken place uh, in the uh, in the uh, British Isles, and most experts, not all, uh, believe this uh, this battle uh, took place on the uh, Wirral uh, Peninsula, and uh, it involved basically uh, armies coming from uh, from Scotland uh, from uh, marauders coming from uh, Ireland, Viking marauders coming from uh, Ireland, uh, aided by uh, Strathclyde Welsh coming down, uh, taking on uh, Anglo-Saxon forces coming from uh, Mercia and from, uh, from, 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 from Wessex. And it was a, a battle uh, to uh, decide whether uh, Britain became one uh, imperial power or remained as uh, as, as separate uh, identities. And it involved uh, King Athelstan, king of the uh, the, the Wessex uh, English, uh, with his uh, brother uh, Prince uh, Edmund uh, from Mercia, uh, fighting uh, against uh, King Constantine of Scots uh, with uh, King Owain of Strathclyde Welsh and uh, with uh, and Olaf Guthridsen. Uh, so it was basically a fight between uh, the English and a, a northern uh, a northern uh, alliance. And uh, as I said, uh, most experts believe this battle uh, took place on uh, the, uh, the 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 Wirral. Uh, one uh, eminent uh, uh, one, one uh, uh, eminent uh, uh, scholar who uh, believes otherwise uh, was the broadcaster uh, Michael uh, Michael Wood, and uh, uh, he's got uh, you know good reasons for suspecting that the battle took place in uh, in 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 in, York, in 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 Yorkshire, and uh, there are other theories as well where the uh, the battle uh, might have uh, taken taken place. Uh, but as I said, the majority of the opinions are that the battle took place uh, on the, uh, the, the, the Wirral. Uh, the battle itself is described in this uh, fabulous uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, poem, contemporary uh, poem, uh, one of the uh, most uh, uh, vivid descriptions in, in Dark Age uh, literature. Uh, which uh, opens up with uh, uh, King Athelstan, patron of heroes, uh, with his uh, brother Prince Edmund, uh, earn themselves eternal glory with the edges of their swords uh, round, uh, round, round, round Brunenborough. And uh, it carries on and then says, uh, never yet uh, on this island has there been a, a greater uh, slaughter of people killed with the uh, edges of the sword. So it was a, a huge battle, a huge uh, bloody, uh, bloody battle. And uh, later sources have uh, indicated that uh, Icelanders may have also been involved uh, with the, uh, with the, the, the battle. Uh, this is from Egil's saga. Uh, which was written some two, three hundred years after the battle. So uh, academic uh, scholars tend to give uh, a lower weighting to the uh, reports uh, from this. But according to Egil's saga, uh, one of Iceland's most famous Vikings, Egil Skallagrimsson, is uh, fighting in the, uh, the battle. Uh, on the side of the English, uh, Athelstan's uh, side, which is the the winning side in the battle. I say winning side. There was great loss of life on on both 
both sides. So although Athelstan uh, came out uh, vic victorious, uh, the uh, the losses were such that uh, uh, in two years' time, I think the the Vikings were back, and in fact, the uh, Athelstan uh, died. So it was a battle uh, for for Britain really to try and decide whether uh, whether Britain would end up as one imperial power with Athelstan as the uh, as the the, uh, the 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 king. Uh, or as a separate uh, identities. And uh, another BBC presenter, uh, Neil Oliver, also captured it uh, uh, very beautifully when he says that the many armies, tens of thousands of warriors clashed at the site known as Brunenborough, where the Mersey estuary enters the sea. For decades afterwards, it was simply known as the Great Battle. This was the mother of all Dark Age bloodbaths and would define the shape of Britain into the modern era. Although Athelstan emerged victorious, the resistance of the Northern Alliance had put an end to his dream of conquering the whole of whole of Britain. This had been a battle of Britain, one of the most important battles in British history, and yet today few people have even heard of it. 937 doesn't quite have the ring of 1066, and yet Brunnemann was about much more than, than blood and conquest. This was a showdown between two very different ethnic identities, a Norse-Celtic alliance versus Anglo-Saxon. It aimed to settle once and for all whether Britain will be controlled by a single imperial power or remain several separate kingdoms. A split in perceptions, which like it or not, is still with us uh, today. And uh, I'll put at the end of the presentation, I'll put a link to this broadcast and also other things that I refer to in the, the presentation. I won't put them on now because you'll, you'll dive out and look at those instead of uh, hearing me, uh, me, 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 me through. So I think uh, Neil Oliver captured things uh, very beautifully in terms of what the uh, the battle uh, was about. And he was one of those who uh, agreed like most uh, most academics that the battle took place on the uh, Wirral uh, Peninsula. And it's easy to see why uh, most academics uh, believe uh, this. Uh, and it comes from the place names. The old name for uh, Bromborough is, is Brunenborough. So Brunenborough is the old name for, uh, for, 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 for Bromborough. And this is an old map of Wirral from Mull from 1724. Uh, and you can see uh, Brunenborough uh, uh, on the, uh, I, can you see my mouse key, folks, or not? I'm just waving my pointer in the hope that you can see it. No, unfortunately not, Stephen. OK, uh, well, Brunenborough is about uh, halfway down the uh, the peninsula on the uh, the right right hand side. That was 17. Uh, 24. And I I blame uh, World Council for this really, or whatever it was in, in the uh, 18th century, because had they not changed the name uh, from Brunenborough to, uh, to, 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 to Bromborough, then uh, there wouldn't be this debate we're having today as to where the, uh, the battle uh, took place. Or maybe, maybe so, I don't, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, right, I've just got something, to hit. right, okay, so it's gone. Uh, so, and the second thing was uh, Dingsmere. Uh, besides Brunenborough appearing in the Anglo-Saxon uh, poem, uh, the other name that appears is, is Dingersmere. And uh, nobody had much clue what this, uh, this Dingersmere uh, meant. Uh, it's the point or the or sea, seaway where the, uh, the Vikings, the Viking marauders uh, were, were sent back to, uh, to Ireland. Uh, and then Back in 2004, I was giving a presentation on uh, Brunenborough. Let's go fast forward that. OK, at the uh, Thurston Visitor Centre, it was to the Battlefields uh, Trust. And I remember giving this talk uh, in this, this place here. And we're talking about Brunenborough. And then I I showed this uh, this this slide, this old slide, and we're all talking about uh, as we're just doing now about 
the old name for, for Bromborough being, uh, being, being Brunenborough, and how we didn't know what this, uh, this Dingersmere uh, meant. And I've mentioned that there were some ideas, uh, something to do with the D, uh, noisy C, but uh, nobody really knew for certain. And then while I was looking at the, at the slide, there's a, a Brunenborough there, but uh, just uh, upwards to the left, you can see a place called uh, Tingwall. Uh, which is the, the old name for modern uh, Thingwall, where the uh, Viking settlers had the assembly or parliament. And then I just thought for a second, you know, Thingwall, uh, Dingersmere. Uh, so maybe uh, Dingersmere is something to do with Thingwall, the mere, the, the waterway of the, uh, the, the thing. And uh, this sounded you know, too obvious to be true. So the the following Monday, I rang up uh, Paul Cavill, who is the uh, research fellow of the English Place Name Society, uh, also conveniently placed at uh, Nottingham. And I remember saying to Paul, you know, could, could this Stingsmere place uh, be uh, something to do with thing, thing wall, the, the mirror of the thing, the waterway of the, 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 the thing? And, and Expecting a sort of dismissal answer back, he says, "Actually, Steve, uh, you might be, uh, you might be right." And so, let's just click that. Uh, we did some more research on it. Uh, myself, uh, Paul, and also uh, Judith Yes, who's professor of Viking studies at the uh, at, 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 at the university, and. Uh, Paul and Judith with a uh, wonderful etymology were able to show that the whole thing was uh, was kosher. And we published this paper uh, revisiting uh, Dingsmere. And uh, so I thought that was uh, that was it. We'd, uh, uh, we, 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 we'd sorted it. So Dingsmere was the place of escape of the uh, the Viking marauders uh, when they escaped back to uh, to, uh, to Ireland. And, uh, but no, <laughs> people were so entrenched in their theories that even uh, that connection of having uh, Brunenborough and Dingsmere uh, literally uh, miles uh, uh, near to each other, uh, apparently sorted, that will be enough to uh, sort out the uh, location of the, uh, the, 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 the battle. Uh, but uh, but no, still the uh, debate uh, rages. Uh, so really, what's uh, what's needed uh, are some uh, major archaeological uh, finds, uh, which can help to uh, pinpoint the battle, which can be definitely associated with the uh, the, the the battle. And then the uh, then the argument is. Uh, is is done and i'll come back to that uh later on because i can then point to the wonderful work that uh, rural archaeology uh the local uh, amateur archaeology group on on rural uh are doing right oh yeah the other thing is that uh, we try to propose where the likely place for, for the things the things mere was uh on the uh, on, on, on the coastline. And the reason why we plumped for the uh, the D coastline was that uh, some uh, 40 odd years after the uh, the battle took place, uh, King Edgar, who was then king of the Anglo-Saxon English, uh, took a party of, uh, of chiefs, of Celtic chiefs, on a little boat trip along the, uh, the River D. And uh, we thought, myself and, and Paul Cavill thought, this was in fact uh, uh, Edgar reminding these, these uh, uh, Celtic chiefs of uh, the carnage that happened uh, 40 or so years ago, just to warn them uh, not to uh, uh, rebel uh, again. So for that reason, we thought uh, it might have been along the D side, but then, uh, in a following paper, I suggested possibly uh, the uh, Dingsmere could have been uh, near Mel's because Mel's was the old uh, Viking uh, Viking seaport uh, in Viking age uh, Wirral. And uh, Dingsmere 
means the waterway or wetland, which could include uh, marshland. And there's uh, loads of uh, old, uh, well, old place names which are connected with uh, uh, of the Old Norse name uh, Car and Holmes for uh, marshy areas. Uh, car comes from the Old Norse Shah, which means uh, brushwood in a marshy area. And uh, Hull means an, an island of, uh, of, of dry land in a, a marshy uh, area. And I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. So uh, Dingsmere could have been anywhere around the uh, Wirral uh, coastline, uh, the D to uh, the North Wirral coast. Some have even suggested it might have been uh, Wallasey uh, Pool, but the uh, debate is still going on uh, about that. Right, so uh, that's a bit of background behind the uh, the bottle. Sorry about the, the technical issues, folks, which uh, uh, slowed us down quite a lot, so we might need to get uh, a move on. But uh, the focus now is not on the, the place name uh, debate or anything like that, uh, but it's just focusing on uh, Wirral itself and what uh, have been the consequences of the battle whether or no the battle took place uh, in Wirral or not. If not, then it's very easy to answer. But uh, the interesting thing is what happened uh, if the battle took place on the uh, the Wirral. Was it the end of the Vikings on the Wirral or not? And we're now going to look at some of the uh, evidence uh, behind uh, that. So if I just... Uh, OK, so uh, what we're going to do is look at uh, Viking Wirral uh, before the uh, the Battle of, of, of Brunanburh uh, and then uh, after. And the evidence we're going to look at uh, are things like uh, minor names uh, and language. Uh, minor place names on Wirral uh, are a good sign of a continuing uh, language or, or dialect that's been spoken by the locals uh, through the uh, through the ages. So we look at the minor names. We look at people carrying uh, Scandinavian names uh, post uh, 937 AD. Uh, we look at a famous uh, 14th century poem which has been uh, associated with uh, with Wirral. This is uh, Sir Gawain and the uh, the Green Knight because uh, some of the action takes place on Wirral and there's uh, strong evidence to link uh, the, not necessarily the poet, but the patron of the poet uh, with the uh, Stanley family of, uh, of, of Storton Hall. And the reason why it's interesting is because it's, it's a pack full of, uh, of Norse uh, dialect uh, words, this uh, 14th century poem. Then uh, we'll look at the Wirral and West Lancashire uh, Viking uh, DNA uh, project. Uh, and then to finish off with, we'll, as an epilogue, uh, we'll look at the uh, ongoing uh, archaeological uh, work uh, by the local group, uh, Wirral uh, Archaeology, and there's some fascinating stuff uh, going on there. Great. So it looks as if you've got our difficulties uh, behind us. Let's uh, so look at Viking Wirral before the Battle of, uh, of, of, of Brunanburh and look for the changes that occurred uh, after that. So the Wirral Peninsula was host, host to uh, a strong uh, Viking settlement, uh, which uh, started in uh, AD 902, as recorded by uh, Irish uh, annals. And this sketch actually is by my, my son, uh, John. Uh, he did this uh, uh, 20 years ago, I think just before he started uh, uh, university. But it's, it's simple, but it's very uh, it, it effective and shows that the uh, wave of Danes came in from the east. And the, there was more of a military conquest, uh, which happened in the eastern settlements that uh, followed, you know, with the Dane law, uh, the split uh, that uh, that followed uh, followed that. Uh, but the more silent incursion were the uh, Norwegian Vikings who came in uh, from the the west, settling in the uh, Scottish uh, Isles, coming down the uh, Irish Sea, uh, the Isle of Man and then uh, in Ireland, 
and in particular uh, Dublin. And then in the year AD 902, the Irish Annals tell us there's a huge battle uh, and the uh, the Vikings were expelled uh, from uh, Ireland and how uh, their leader, Ingemund, came to the Queen of the English, uh, Queen Ethelfled, daughter of uh, King Alfred, for permission to settle in land somewhere on condition that they uh, didn't attack uh, any English. And uh, Queen Ethelfled gave uh, Ingemund and the uh, Vikings leaving Ireland permission to set, settle uh, in lands near Chester, which we presume was the uh, Wirral uh, Peninsula. And uh, the reason for that, as you look at the place names, and uh, you're probably looking at this and, uh, you know, here we go. There's another Scouser who can't, who can't spell properly. But no, this is uh, an attempt at uh, uh, putative, putative Viking names uh, for uh, place names that uh, still exist on the Wirral and place names that uh, used to exist but no longer, like Kilmalby, uh, which have got uh, Norse or Irish Norse uh, roots. And you can see the mostly concentrated in uh, the northwest of the uh, peninsula. And I put uh, Dingers Mere, Things Mere here, but it could be round here or even round here. This is just a our favoured uh, position. So this is a uh, uh, Viking Wirral after the uh, Ingerman settlements, which followed after the year uh, AD uh, 902. And the Irish Annals tells us of uh, attempts after five years of, of settlement to uh, attack Chester and take uh, control of uh, Chester. We don't know what the final result was because the uh, the, the, the uh, annals uh, called the three fragments uh, stopped there. The rest of the story uh, was uh, lost. But I think it's uh, reasonable to suggest that on the whole the uh, the settlement was uh, was peaceful and that there was a gradual uh, integration as time uh, progressed. And uh, yes, uh, if you go back a slide, if you go to uh, uh, Irby, which itself is a, a Viking name, meaning settlement of the Irish or settlement of uh, uh, Vikings coming from Ireland, there's this wonderful uh, signpost. And this shows that you're right in the center of, uh, of Viking uh, Wirral. So all these uh, names of Viking in origin, apart from possibly Peswell, which is Anglo-Saxon uh, influenced by the uh, Vikings. And to get a picture of this, I had to get up at, uh, at five o'clock in the morning and take a little stool uh, just to uh, uh, hope there's no police uh, watching. Oh gosh, you know, real archaeology is full of police. But uh, uh, I had to do, I, I, did, I repositioned some of these signs so I could get them all in the, uh, in the photograph. And because it was five in the morning, no one was misled. And I put the signs uh, back in the uh, original uh, original uh, position. So this shows you that the uh, uh, the Vikings were uh, were here in uh, significant uh, numbers. Now, if you look at the minor place names. You see a more spread uh, across this uh, this boundary, uh, which uh, was based on the uh, the major place names. So this is, is an example of, uh, of spread of the, the Viking influence, uh, the Viking uh, language. Uh, and minor names would change depending on the, uh, the farmer or people who were living in the uh, locality uh, with time. Whereas major place names didn't change unless uh, incoming people uh, couldn't pronounce uh, the name of the, uh, the previous uh, inhabitants. And there's examples of the uh, the Vikings changing the names of Derby and, uh, and and Whitby in Yorkshire because they couldn't uh, pronounce the names. But generally speaking, on Wirral, uh, that uh, that didn't happen. Now the reason why I'm showing you the the minor names is that uh, minor names, because they change, uh, and if you have a persistence of names uh, which have Scandinavian elements, this shows you that you have a persistence of the uh, Scandinavian uh, language. And uh, there are hundreds of examples on the uh, Wirral uh, Peninsula. 
there's something there's over 50 uh, cars which mean uh, the marshland home uh, there's about 30 of those there's over 100 uh, rakes and there's gills slacks arrows brex weights clints and uh, uh, many other uh, names in fact uh, someone said that uh, Wirral had uh, more uh, rakes than uh, Alan Tishmarsh or Monty Dom. These are, for those people not in the UK, these are uh, BBC uh, gardening uh, presenters. Uh, more homes than uh, Dr. Bonados and uh, more cars than Jeremy Clarkson. Okay, there were that many uh, of these names on the uh, the, 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 the will. And uh, yeah, I've, uh, Wainwright was the first one to really point uh, this out and the, the link uh, with, uh, with, with, with language. And if I just uh, move on. Yeah, here's some examples. This is uh, Heskus in uh, Irby. Uh, Heskus means uh, Heskun Hesterskeg, which means a horse uh, racetrack. This is where uh, the Vikings used to race their horses. There's another Heskus Hes uh, near uh, Thornton. Uh, huff. Uh, this is the uh, the Barnston Gill. Gill means a, a slope or uh, ravine at the bottom of Gill Lane. This is where uh, the Gill uh, goes down to the uh, River Fender. Uh, this is one of the many many cars on uh, Wirral. This is Car Lane in uh, in Mells, and this is the uh, the Eastern. Uh, rake, one of uh, over a hundred examples of rakes. You see, you get uh, there's two or three rake lanes, and uh, rake actually is used to denote a lane. So when you see rake lane, it actually translates as lane lane. Uh, this is the uh, Wallasey Breck with Breck, which means a uh, slope on a, a hillside. There's uh, several examples of, uh, of of Breck, and in fact across the uh, uh, the Mersey in Liverpool, uh, there's Walton Breck Road, which is right next to uh, uh, Ampere Football Ground, because the Vikings were uh, settled in large numbers in uh, in Lancashire, in fact, all the way up the all the way up the uh, northwest coast to the uh, the Solway. Uh, then you've got a Thwaite here, Northwaite Road, which means uh, clearing, and uh, this is not far from Bidston, where there's many examples of uh, Thwaite uh, Place. Uh, names and if you go along Milford Road, you come to the uh, the big Granny Rock, uh, which used to be called the the Clints uh, back in 1642, which comes from the Old Norse, Old Danish Clint, which means uh, projecting rock. And there's other examples of that on the Wirral. Uh, this is Arrow Park, uh, signpost Arrow Park, which comes from the Old Norse Argi, which means a uh, uh, clearing, a uh, uh, far uh, pasture line away from the farmhouse. And uh, there's several examples of slackies, uh, which means a, a, a cut through. And this is the actual former slack pub on, Mil on uh, uh, in, in, in Heswell. Uh, so uh, many, many more examples, but these are a few examples of, uh, of, minor, of minor names. And uh, if we move now to Scandinavian people after AD uh, 937, uh, then we see uh, many examples of, uh, of Scandinavian names from uh, from uh, uh, from Doomsday and other uh, post uh, 937 uh, records. And there's some fabulous names here, like uh, Raffenschwarte, uh, the the Black uh, Raven, Hunding. Hunding actually appears in uh, the Wide of the Valkyries. I think he's a a, a baddie. Uh, there. There's this lady, uh, Sigrid, and some of these uh, are modern uh, modern names like uh, Gunnar, a uh, good friend of ours. Gunnar is uh, works at the uh, uh, the Vasa in, uh, in 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 Sweden. Hawkon, uh, Hawkon is uh, my head of uh, head of department, head of school uh, in uh, the Cultural History Museum in uh, in, in 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 Oslo. Uh, and also uh, moneyers. There's evidence of names of Scandinavians uh, from uh, from Chester, the, the, the mint in, uh, in 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 Chester. Uh, Gamel is an interesting name. Uh, Gamel means old, but also an old uh, old Norse uh, personal uh, name, and uh, it appears uh, opposite. 
St. Olaf's Church in, uh, in Chester, uh, and this is Gamal Terrace. The name actually Gamal doesn't come from the original Viking, but comes from uh, Francis uh, Gamal, who was the former uh, mayor of Chester from the, uh, the, the 17th century, but he carries the name of a, uh, a, 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 a Viking. And it's nice this being just opposite uh, St. Olaf's, you see see this reflection of the, the spire of St. Olaf in the uh, the window. This is the brewery tap pub <laughs> across the uh, the road. This is St. Olaf's. This picture was taken some years ago. About I took this picture about 20 years ago, actually, uh, when it looked beautiful. Uh, now it's not so beautiful. It's got scaffolding around the walls. It's been left uh, into a, a, a state of uh, disrepair. Uh, but that's uh, another story. And uh, we know St. Olaf's Church is post 937 because uh, St. Olaf didn't die in the uh, Battle of Sickelstaff until 29th of July uh, 1030. And uh, this church dedicated to St. Olaf, it's not the original church of the, uh, the Vikings, but uh, the current uh, church building uh, was built in the uh, the 17th uh, century and then was uh, uh, later added to in the uh, 19th century. But it would have been on the site of the uh, original church in uh, in Scandinavian well, Scandinavian sector of Chester. And uh, you can see this from the the parish name. So this is the Scandinavian southern part of Chester, St Olaf's uh, parish. And then you have the, the English, Anglo-Saxon or English uh, side, uh, what would be the English because uh, by uh, 1037, then uh, the, we, we had a uh, defined uh, England. It would have been, uh, I think, the reign of King uh, Canute. I'm not a history it's a historian, by the way, I'm a, uh, as a, a, a scientist. So uh, you had this integration uh, of uh, Scandinavian and English communities in a uh, thriving financial centre of, uh, of Chester in the 11th uh, century, a, a perfect example of uh, integration. And uh, I haven't got 90 slides, by the way, uh, a lot of these uh, uh, I don't know if you can see the number of slides I've got, but no, probably not. You can just see the uh, the presentation. Uh, okay, but on my screen, it's got 90. That's not uh, 90 slides, folks. If you, if you can see 90, don't get too frightened. I'm not going to be here till uh, midnight. But just to say that Michael, Michael Wood, uh, you know, Michael, who has this opposing theory about where the uh, the Battle of, uh, of Brunenborough uh, has taken place, he admits that he's in the uh, minority, although you know he argues the case for uh, for Yorkshire uh, from good academic uh, reasons, and it's not uh, fait complete that the the battle uh, took place on the uh, the 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 the, the, the waiting really for the uh, the archaeology uh, to uh, confirm that. But uh, Michael's a good uh, friend. He's written forwards uh, of books uh, of mine, such as this one uh, with, uh, you can see that with Mark uh, Jobling and uh, Turi King on uh, Michael uh, on uh, Viking DNA with uh, Michael's name uh, down uh, there. And then uh, a few years ago, uh, we joined him for uh, this uh, BBC series, The uh, Great British Story, where he covered the Vikings in Wirral and also uh, the Vikings in, uh, in, 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 in Chester. And that was, uh, that was great fun. Right, uh, more Scandinavian people after AD uh, 937. This occurs uh, in place names. So uh, men and, uh, and women uh, from the, the Viking Age on afterwards, uh, have had their names uh, uh, forever uh, in the uh, the place names in the region. Place names that still survive and place names that have uh, gone. Uh, major names like uh, Thurston, 
which is Torstein's uh, uh, farmstead, uh, Whitby, uh, which may be Vitti's uh, B, uh, Vitti's uh, settlement. It could be the white, uh, the white settlement, and uh, and, and Frank B. Uh, and many uh, minor names uh, as uh, well. And the women uh, I've indicated in uh, red, uh, red here. So that shows that women play uh, an, an important part in uh, Norse uh, Wirral. And if I just advance, these are where they are. Sigrid, she has a half land in uh, Wallasey. Uh, Ingrid, uh, she is near uh, Capenhurst, and Wirral has its own Scylla, believe it or not, uh, in the former place name of, uh, of, of, of Scyllaby. Ragnhild and uh, Gunhild, uh, their names appear uh, no longer, the, not since uh, the 14th century in the case of uh, Ragnhild and uh, uh, the 19th century uh, with uh, with Gunhilde uh, in the region around uh, Tramir. So uh, this is now uh, the Camelard's uh, shipyard, and uh, so and Gunhild's pool is now part of the uh, Tramir uh, oil terminal, which is sad. Really, here's uh, uh, I have to slip this in. This is uh, Tramir Rovers. Uh, uh, football ground. Tramir is an old Viking name, uh, which comes from uh, the uh, the sandbank uh, or uh, sandbank of the herons or crane birds. This one we called uh, Tranny, the, uh, the, the 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 heron. And uh, if you see a heron fly over, then you know there's a good chance that Tramir might win. Uh, it didn't win on Saturday. That's probably because we couldn't see a uh, a heron. Uh, and that's actually why I got interested in the Vikings many years ago when I found out that my football team uh, was a uh, a Viking name. But that's a, another another story. Right, and just around the corner from Prenton Park, the home of Tramier Rovers, you can find the uh, the Arno, uh, which comes from uh, Arnie's Arnie's Haug, or Ernie's Haug, uh, or mound uh, burial mound. So underneath all these uh, trees. Uh, Possibly, Arnie is uh, is buried under here. Uh, we uh, don't know. This is uh, uh, one of uh, of two examples of uh, uh, of Viking burial sites on the uh, on the Wirral. Okay. Now, in terms of post 937 AD uh, archaeology, uh, there's lots of Viking archaeology being found uh, on. Uh, on Wirral, uh, you know, Viking houses of, of houses that Vikings were occupied, uh, one in uh, Irby and uh, one in uh, in Lingham, Morton. Uh, there's uh, some fabulous, uh, uh, fabulous uh, uh, finds at Mells, the old uh, Viking uh, seaport. Uh, there's what appears to be the remains of a Viking uh, burial. So Axed, Shieldboss, and Fent. Uh, spearheads, ring pins, uh, brooches, uh, all sorts found at uh, at Mel's. Uh, there's uh, some fabulous uh, stonework at uh, at Neston. Uh, remains of at least three uh, crosses, and one of which has been uh, re a replica has been built. Uh, which we call the uh, the Viking uh, Lady Cross, and there's other examples in Woodchurch, in uh, in 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 in, in Bromborough. and there's this magnificent uh, Viking hogback tombstone at West Kirby. This is the only one we can say definitely uh, is post uh, 937, uh, found in West Kirby, which is a Viking name, the West uh, Wirral, the best West village of the church, Vestby Kirkby. To distinguish itself from Kirkby, which is the old name of, uh, of Wallasey uh, Village, and in St Bridget's Church, which was, uh, we believe, founded by the Vikings when they came over from uh, Ireland. Many of the Vikings would have been Christian because they would have had uh, uh, Celtic uh, wives who may not have Christianized then, but they would have uh, uh, done that uh, to uh, the, uh, the children. 
So uh, this once, we believe, once marked the grave of a prominent uh, Viking person uh, on, uh, on, on, on Wirral in the West Kirby, uh, West Kirby area. And from the style and form, it's been dated to uh, after uh, 1000. So this is definitely uh, post 937. Another example of the surviving and, uh, and obviously thriving of a uh, Viking community on Wirral post 937. Uh, to have this sort of monument, this person must have been uh, very, uh, very important. And this is one of two hogback tombstones found on the Wirral. The other was found uh, in 2004 in someone's uh, back garden in in Bidston. Although that one, we're not sure about the, the date. It's possibly earlier than 93, uh, 937. And here's uh, the uh, hogback cake. This was uh, made by Elizabeth Davy uh, in 2012 to mark the uh, the 120th birthday of the uh, Charles Dawson Brown uh, Museum. And uh, that was reopened uh, just uh, a, a few years ago. It was reopened a, a few years ago after a big appeal to raise, uh, ra ra raise funds. So that was uh, uh, a nice example of how uh, locals treasure the uh, Viking uh, heritage. Then there's this. This is an example of, uh, of uh, Scandinavian customs persisting throughout the uh, throughout the uh, the centuries. I mean, what what, what is this? Uh, this is actually uh, rent book or parts of rent books from uh, Sutton and uh, Childerthornton parishes. And what's interesting about these uh, these rentals uh, from uh, 1398, Little Sutton Childerthornton, was the names of some of the people paying uh, rent. And if I just expand this uh, here, uh, you've got a Richard de Honda's son, uh, you've got a Agnes Honda's doctor, uh, Johanna Honda's doctor, and uh, Mabilla uh, Reynolds' uh, doctor. Uh, and this beautiful writing by uh, the, uh, the scribe and uh, all it's telling is about the, the fact that paying uh, rent uh, for uh, a cottage uh, or in terms of Agnes and Johanna, uh, Richard uh, for some land, the Bobates of land, and uh, Mabilla also renting a, 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 a cottage. And this form of naming people uh, is something that is basically uh, from the, uh, the, the Vikings. It's still done in modern day Iceland uh, and uh, in Scandinavia. Uh, it's It was done until uh, 100, 200 years ago when, it's, when, it, when it was changed. So this is an example of Scandinavian custom uh, still being practiced uh, into the uh, 14th and almost the, the 15th uh, centuries. And uh, this uh, applies to my next example. Now, if I go back to this old Viking uh, map of uh, Wirral again, there's uh, Tranmere, uh, by the way. Uh, now, if you go to uh, this place, Storton uh, is very interesting. Storton uh, means the, uh, the great uh, farmstead in uh, Old uh, Norse, like the Storting in Norway, the, the, great, uh, the great parliament. Storton, uh, the great uh, farmstead, uh, with inside the uh, putative uh, Norse uh, barrier, uh, Norse, I say, boundary. Uh, over the years, it became uh, much less a boundary because of the integration uh, take place. There's Thingwall not far uh, away, but uh, Storton became home of the the Stanley family. Stanley, one of the most powerful families in England, who uh, became the Earls of Derby. And the, St the Stanleys were initially uh, master foresters of, uh, of Wirral. And uh, this is part of uh, some of the 
the 14th century buildings from uh, from uh, Stoughton uh, Hall. And there's a family interest here because my uh, mum is uh, descended from the, uh, the the Stanleys. My mum's a, a Wharton from uh, the Wirral, from uh, from Morton, from Lingenham and 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 Morton. And uh, thanks to Audrey uh, Young, uh, uh, an enthusiast, a name enthusiast who uh, is also descended from the uh, the Stanleys uh, through a a different line. And uh, this is where uh, we uh, link in through Ellen Stanley. Uh, in the uh, 18th century, who married uh, uh, Johannes uh, Hannes Wharton. So there's some personal interest uh, in uh, in this. But if you go back, uh, you come to uh, Sir Thomas uh, Stanley, uh, Second Lord Stanley. He was the uh, the Stanley who uh, apparently, uh, to call to Shakespeare, uh, killed uh, Richard the. Uh, the, the, the the third that put the first uh, sword into uh, Richard the uh, the third, uh, which is probably why uh, we're not so welcome in uh, in in Leicester. Just just joking, of course. But uh, if you go back even further, then uh, you come to uh, Sir John Stanley, uh, the first uh, knight of the uh, the Garter from the 14th century, when uh, Richard II uh, was king, and then uh, going through into Henry III. You know, more Shakespeare uh, plays uh, for you uh, there. But uh, John Stanley is very interesting from our point of view because he's connected with the uh, Sir Gawain and Green Knight poet. And that is of relevance to us in trying to show uh, what happened to the Viking influence on Wirral after the Battle of Brunebrough. I stress if the battle took place on uh, Wirral. Okay, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, a uh, famous uh, 14th century poem uh, written about the same time as uh, as uh, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, but very different in the style of the uh, the, the language. And uh, this is the uh, original manuscript by the unknown poet on the uh, left, and uh, on the right is one of the translations. This is by uh, by Tolkien and uh, and Gordon, and I just missed Tolkien. Uh, I was uh, lucky enough to get a place uh, at uh, uh, Oxford when I was uh, uh, in my younger days, and Tolkien was the one of the fellows at uh, at the college I was about to to join, uh, Pembroke College. So I was looking forward ever so much to uh, to meeting him. Two weeks before I, I went up, uh, he died, so uh, I never got the uh, I never got the chance, which was uh, very uh, sad. But to go back to the uh, poem again, it's a, a fascinating uh, poem uh, which uh, describes, it uh, uh, starts off in, uh, uh, in Camelot, uh, Arthur's court, and how this uh, mysterious green knight comes in uh, on Christmas Day that uh, offers uh, a challenge to uh, Arthur and the court. And uh, the challenge is uh, as, uh, as, as, as follows. Basically, it's to a, a duel. And it's a combat, a duel involving uh, basically uh, two people, and each takes a blow with a sword at the other, with the uh, opponent, the challenger, taking the first blow first. And uh, Arthur dismisses this, saying this is ridiculous because uh, you just be killed uh, straight away. But no, the Green Knight insists, and uh, Arthur asks a member of his court, and he wants to take uh, this guy on. And Sir Gawain uh, volunteers himself, uh, and of course abides by the rule of the contest. 
and of course takes the first blow, chops uh, so, uh, chop, chops the Green Knight's uh, head off, and then to everyone's amazement, the Green Knight uh, stands up, picks his head up, and then walks out and reminds Sir Gawain about the rules of the contest, that uh, the Green Knight has the second blow, and it's a year to the day from uh, from this incident. And it would take place at the Green Chapel, which Sir Gawain has to go and find. And of course, Sir Gawain, as a man of honour, uh, duly uh, does this. And the poem describes how he travels up from Camelot uh, along the uh, English uh, Welsh uh, borders and then into Wales and then through into Wirral, which uh, the poet describes as the wilderness of Wirral in the search for the uh, Green uh, Chapel. And he finds the Green Chapel, he finds the Green Knight, and as a man of honour, he offers himself uh, for the, uh, the second blow. But because he's been a man of honour, and also he's passed certain tests, temptations that have been put his way uh, along the, the, German, uh, the, the, the journey, the, uh, the, 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 the Green Knight uh, spurs his life. And that's how the, uh, the story ends. But the interest from our point of view is that the poem uh, is really stuffed full of uh, Norse uh, dialect uh, words. I mean, the, the list is uh, extensive. It's to uh, store, big, uh, garter means a, a street, uh, uh, rank, uh, bus uh, to get dressed, rank is a knight, carp to chatter, kest to throw, Durf is, uh, is, is, is stout, full of these uh, dialect words which were not typically assimilated in uh, conventional uh, English, which by then had also uh, assimilated other uh, Norse names like egg and law and, uh, and, and, and whatever. So it was very unusual having all these Norse uh, words. And the action taking place in the Wirral uh, as well, uh, that turned people towards uh, Sir John Stanley as either the possible poet or uh, the uh, patron of the, po the, 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 the poet, because uh, Knight of the Garter, he uh, operated in all the uh, appropriate, uh, appropriate circles. So uh, there is this uh, feeling that it was Sir John Stanley connected with the uh, poem, or someone not far away from the Wirral. So this gives a clue as to the sort of uh, dialect that uh, was being spoken uh, again in uh, 14th and into the 15th century in uh, Wirral, reinforcing this view uh, of this continuation of the Scandinavian influence uh, post 937. Right, so the next thing is, could uh, Staunton Hall be the uh, the Green Chapel itself? Maybe Stanley uh, dreamed of this, so he put a bit of a green tinge on here, uh, just in case. Right, the next, or well, the final piece of evidence really is the, uh, the, 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 the DNA, and I'm, I'm sorry we're running over time because of those uh, uh, those difficulties at the uh, the start, but I think we've we're catching up on ourselves. So the final piece of evidence for survival of the influence of the Vikings uh, in Wirral post 937 uh, is uh, DNA, which is, uh, okay, DNA is not so we can, we haven't got DNA so we can find out about our ancestors. DNA codes life. It's the code of life. That's why we have uh, DNA. DNA makes proteins, makes enzymes, like everything else, and uh, which uh, controls what we are and our metabolism and uh, everything else. But because we get our DNA from our ancestors, it's also a message uh, from our ancestors. And uh, again, I have a, a, a strong personal interest in the uh, in the DNA uh, story because uh, uh, my 
former boss, uh, a guy called Michael Creek, uh, was everyone's heard of Watson and Crick in terms of working out the double helix, but uh, not many people have heard of uh, of Creek, who was a PhD student supervised by uh, uh, Gulland and Jordan uh, back at Nottingham, and uh, Creek supervised by supervisors, uh, was the guy who discovered the, the bonds uh, which hold the, uh, the DNA molecule together, the two strands of the DNA molecule, bonds which are called uh, hydrogen bonds. And uh, a few years ago, we had a, a meeting of the, uh, of the Biochemical uh, Society uh, to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the uh, discovery of uh, these bonds in 1947-1948, uh, a few years before the uh, the Watson Crick uh, discovery. This is a paper uh, which came out of that uh, meeting, the Guy Channel and uh, Mary Phillips Jones, uh, and uh, it was a really nice occasion. And Crete's family came up, and it, it was uh, uh, it was nice that uh, that discovery could be. Uh, could be uh, recognized. Creek himself came up with his own structure for DNA, an approximate structure, which had uh, two strands. It wasn't this, this is the Watson Crick structure, uh, but uh, it didn't have the, the helix because the uh, crystallographic information from uh, Rosalind Franklin wasn't uh, available at that time. Anyway, that's just a little uh, aside. So DNA is a message uh, from our ancestors. And uh, nowadays, this is a uh, big business because there's loads of, uh, uh, of companies uh, which specialize in testing your uh, DNA and telling you about your uh, ancestors, you know, Oxford ancestors, ancestry, uh, Ukraine, UK, family tree, uh, National Geographic, uh, all these organizations are offering uh, DNA tests for you uh, to check your ancestry. And the bond testing is largely uh, based on what we call autosomal uh, DNA. Uh, our DNA is packaged into uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes. We have uh, one pair of sex chromosomes, which uh, dictate whether we are man or woman, man, uh, X and Y, woman to X chromosomes. Uh, and uh, the rest we call autosomal. Uh, DNA, which controls all our characteristics. And uh, much of the modern DNA testing in terms of ancestry uh, is in terms of the autosomal uh, DNA. Because we get half from our mums, half from our dads, and go back further, uh, they get half of theirs from their mums, their dads, and, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. So every generation, the, uh, the DNA uh, is uh, mixed. But we're looking for certain uh, motifs, uh, polymorphisms, signatures uh, present. Uh, it's possible to get an idea from databases of how, you know, what proportion of you comes from this area or this part of the world or this part of the world. Uh, and that's all very interesting from an individual uh, perspective. But from a population perspective uh, of great interest, is the DNA on the, the male Y chromosome, because it's one of uh, two parts of our DNA, which is passed along uh, from generation to generation with no change, no shuffling between uh, mums and dads. The other is what we call mitochondrial DNA, which is passed down the uh, maternal line, and the Y chromosomal DNA uh, is passed down the uh, paternal line with little or no uh, change. Uh, and it can be linked to surnames because surnames are passed along the, uh, the, the male line uh, with little or no change. Uh, changes when you have non-paternities, adoptions, uh, and this sort of thing. But otherwise, uh, surnames are passed along the male line along with the DNA on the Y chromosome. So although it's only 1%, or so of a person's uh, DNA. So in terms of ancestry, it's not that uh, not that indicative because it's just a small percentage of our uh, DNA. In terms of population ancestry, 
it's very powerful because of this link to surnames and the ability to get behind large population uh, movements uh, that have occurred during industrial revolution and other uh, other big events that might have occurred uh, along the historical line. So it's a good way of determining uh, population ancestry. And that formed the uh, the basis of the Wirral and West Lancashire Viking DNA project, uh, which started in 2002 following the uh, the BBC2 uh, Blood of uh, Vikings uh, series, which uh, introduced the modern genetic methods for uh, the testing of uh, ancestry based on the uh, the male uh, Y uh, chromosome. So in 2002, uh, we had a grant from uh, one of the research councils, uh, ourselves uh, at Nottingham, uh, myself, Judith Yash, and also uh, Mark Jobling from the uh, University of Leicester, who's professor of uh, population genetics uh, down there. Of course, Leicester is very famous for population genetics work. That's where uh, Alex Jeffries did his uh, DNA fingerprinting work uh, for uh, criminal investigations. And later on, it's where uh, all the work uh, on uh, Richard III uh, was uh, was done. Uh, and that and that uh, and Turi King was the person who led that. Uh, but years ago, when we were doing this uh, this project, Turi was uh, Mark's uh, PhD student uh, working uh, working on uh, this. So uh, using surnames combined with uh, with uh, DNA, uh, we were able to get behind the uh, the large population movements that occurred in uh, in Wirral and neighbouring neighbouring West Lancashire. Uh, following the uh, Industrial Revolution and the growth of the uh, Liverpool region as a port. Uh, and these are some of the names from Wirral uh, that uh, we had uh, from uh, tax uh, uh, subsidy rolls, tax paying records from the time of Henry VIII, uh, criminal records. Uh, uh, were down there somewhere, uh, Harding. We were accused of uh, uh, killing a dog and damaging hedges in 1350 or something. Uh, found uh, not uh, not guilty, and also alehouse records. These were all names that we found prior to 1600, which were in the Wirral area. Uh, and we had a similar list from West Lancashire, people paying towards the uh, uh, stipend of the priest of Our Lady at Ormskirk. Uh, and other uh, ancient records as well, uh, which gave us a list of names or target surnames uh, for the, uh, the, the the survey. And you had to have a name on the list to take part in the survey. Also, you have to be able to say that your uh, paternal grandfather, at least, uh, was from uh, the area. And as far back as you knew uh, that uh, your paternal line came from the uh, area. So with the help of the uh, West Lancashire Heritage Association and local groups on the uh, the, the Wirral, we were able to get a, uh, uh, a sufficient number of volunteers uh, to take part in the uh, in, 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 in the survey. And uh, this was published in uh, 2008 uh, in uh, Molecular Biology and uh, Evolution. And uh, you can see the it involved a great deal of outreach work, and, and you can see that if you want to on the NCMH outreach or lab outreach page. And again, I'll give you the link uh, for that on the chat at the end of the uh, presentation. And uh, this is what we uh, we found. Uh, so this is all based on the uh, Y chromosome. This is what's based, what we call uh, Y chromosome types of men or haplo haplo groups. And uh, you can see that depending on uh, which part of the world uh, you're in, then uh, you get different distributions of these uh, Y chromosome uh, types. So uh, in Western Europe, uh, the only places where you get significant proportions of uh, this type, uh, which we call R1A1, 
uh, is in Norway and in those regions settled by uh, Norwegian uh, Vikings. And you get different proportions of other uh, DNA types as well in Norway, uh, very different uh, proportions uh, in uh, Ireland and, uh, and, 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 and Scotland. Uh, and so by comparing the uh, uh, distributions of the chromosomal types uh, and doing various uh, uh, statistics, you can get an idea of how similar uh, populations are to each, uh, each other. And uh, doing these uh, comparisons, this is uh, Wirral without the, uh, the surname criteria. This is West Lancashire without the surname criteria. And you can see the, uh, the change when you move to what we call medieval samples. That means that based on uh, men who have uh, Y chromosomes from uh, the, uh, the, 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 the region. And if you do these analyses, you find that up to 50% of the DNA admixture in old Wirral and old West Lancashire families appears to be a Scandinavian in the origin. That doesn't mean 50% of the blokes uh, are Vikings and 50% are not. It means the, the admixture, the mix of the, uh, the chromosomes amongst uh, those uh, groups is up to, up to 50%, eh? up to uh, because there's uh, error and things involved, uh, it's, you know, the error is within uh, 10, 15 uh, percent, but still showing that the, uh, the Scandinavian influence in the old populations is uh, very uh, significant. And you get the same result if you just focus on the uh, R1A1 signature, which is uh, common in Norway and uh, only in those other places which are populated by, which were populated by uh, Norwegians, uh, Vikings leaving uh, Nor Norway, uh, or post-Viking Norway. Uh, so there's no way of distinguishing, of course, whether uh, these movements, uh, these people uh, happened during the Viking Age or, 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 or later, uh, unless you examine uh, ancient DNA from um, bodies that have been discovered, which could be said to be from uh, that period. Uh, but uh, that's, uh, again, another topic. Uh, so with this R1A1 signal by itself, uh, you can see also that the, uh, the signals for West Lancashire and Wirral are, again, up to 50% of the uh, DNA admixture uh, or result for, uh, for, 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 for Norway. So this was uh, pretty uh, convincing uh, for a continuation of the, uh, the Viking influence post 937. And more recently, uh, this is a, pub I don't even see that, but this is a paper uh, we published uh, a few uh, months uh, ago. And, uh, oh, someone said slides are not updated. Can you all see a slide, uh, those that can respond? Can you all see a slide with some, uh, like a like a tree of data? Yes, I can see it. All right, great. Okay, we're near the end, near the end, Diane. Okay, don't worry too much. We're coming near the end. But uh, this was a, what one of the, uh, I'm going to go back a slide. Uh, one of the assumptions we, we made was the fact that uh, the R1A1 uh, we saw in the, uh, the British population uh, distributions we were looking at came from Norway. But R1A1 is also prevalent in uh, Eastern Europe and also in India. So we made that assumption this came from, uh, uh, from, 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 from Norway. And uh, we were able to check that very recently because uh, you know, 10 years has gone by since, over 10 years since the original uh, survey, and the resolution of the method has increased uh, dramatically. Uh, so we can now do uh, some subgroup testing of the uh, R1A1 and distinguish uh, the R1A1 type uh, from Norway from other uh, sources. And uh, fortunately, uh, what we find is that the R1A1 types found in uh, England, particularly northern England, is of the type uh, that's found in, uh, in in Norway, that's R1A1 
GML 9 and uh, GML uh, 8, uh, 8 star. So that confirms the what we found uh, all those uh, years ago, which was uh, a, uh, a relief. And uh, if you're interested, then you can find out more in the uh, Viking DNA book, which we published after the uh, the, the, the main uh, publication with a foreword by Michael Wood. OK, so uh, that shows that although uh, academic scholars can disagree about one thing like the location of the Battle of, of, of Brunenburg, they can agree and work together on uh, on other things. That's how uh, that's how uh, it works. So the conclusion uh, is that if the battle took place on Wirral, and taking into account all the evidence, uh, the minor name evidence, place name evidence, the personal name evidence, uh, the survival of Scandinavian customs uh, with those uh, rental documents, uh, evidence of language from uh, the, for example, the Sir Gawain uh, poem, uh, if it is associated with the, uh, the, the Stanley uh, the standard family, and finally the DNA uh, evidence is that if the battle took place on Wirral, then short or long term, the uh, the Viking uh, community uh, or contribution to an integrated Anglo-Scandinavian community survived, and at a substantial uh, level, or. <laughs> This is the obvious. If the battle took place somewhere else, then the uh, the Viking community thrived uh, regardless and uh, integrated into an Anglo-Scandinavian uh, community. Of course, uh, you could argue that the fact that this evidence, particularly the DNA evidence, maybe uh, is a sign that the battle didn't take place on the uh, the, the Wirral if uh, the uh, Vikings uh, remain. And uh, the feeling is that during the Battle of Brunanburg, uh, which involved these uh, the Scottish coming from the north, uh, with uh, Strathclyde Welsh joining them, and then the uh, new wave of, uh, of Vikings coming from uh, Ireland and uh, Anlaf or Olaf uh, uh coming in. Uh, and Icelanders involved as well. Uh, if Egil Saga is to believe, and they were fighting on the other side, Athelstan's side, so he had Vikings fighting uh, Vikings. Uh, what did the local community do uh, at uh, that time? Did they take part in the battle, or did they? It was becoming a more integrated community then. Did they just uh, uh, batten down their hatches and wait for them all to, uh, uh, to 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 go away? Well, that seems to have been the seems to have been the uh, seems to be the case. Uh, and uh, uh, that seems to uh, confirm the issue. Well, it doesn't confirm that the uh, the battle took place on uh, Wirral. So uh, many talks have epilogues, and uh, this one is mine. And uh, for the epilogue, I want to go to back back to this again. This slide I showed before about the simple reasons why the uh, we feel the battle took place on uh, Wirral because of the the place names and the uh, locality of the the Brunenburg and uh, Dingersmere uh, things uh, mere uh, names uh, I mean people argue we don't like it on the Wirral because it's not near York or or this uh, if battle is called the Battle of Brunenburg and the place is called Brunenburg, then it's it's really difficult to argue uh, otherwise. Uh, although there were uh, alternative forms of the uh, the battle name that were found uh, elsewhere, but having Brunenburg and Dingersmere together, that's pretty convincing. But I think to really convince everybody, uh, then the archaeology uh, needs to uh, to prove that. And uh, after we'd uh, worked out things, Mayor, we, we came out with a suggestion of where the battle area uh, took place. Uh, 
this is uh, from one of my publications, I think back in uh, actually 2001, but also uh, in a publication in 2009, uh, it was in Michael Livingston's uh, uh, case book on, 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 on Brunenburg. And uh, uh, I suggested this was possibly the uh, location of the, uh, the, the, the battle because of its uh, uh, a number of, uh, of, of, of reasons. Uh, if these were the Viking lines here, then it would take uh, a while for the Viking uh, forces, if they were fleeing after the, uh, the Anglo-Saxons had broken through, uh, to get to uh, the ships at, uh, at Dingsmere, or not necessarily their ships, but vessels which they could escape from. And it was just here that uh, would be quite quick. And the, the Anglo-Saxon poem uh, tells us that the uh, the chase it took throughout the whole of the day uh, for the uh, the battle to continue until the uh, the Vikings were able to escape uh, on the uh, in, in their boats. The the Scots, by the way, uh, got back by different means by uh, not by uh, by boats but by uh, by by feet. So this seemed to uh, tick uh, all the uh, the boxes. Also, its proximity to uh, Brunner's Burr, Brunner's uh, Fortress, which we uh, believe uh, was, uh, was 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 Poulsen uh, Hall, and in that article in uh, the the case book, which is edited by uh, Michael Livingston, uh, I concluded with the following statement: uh, narrowing down the possibilities in this way by all this evidence, may also help the field archaeologists uh, find that the, uh, find uh, evidence from archaeology of the battle, although the chances of finding significant remains would appear to be remote. OK, these are the words that I said uh, back in uh, 2009. Then refer to uh, Francis Tudsbury, uh, who worked uh, one of the first ones to work on uh, the battle and locating it with Riddle uh, back at the end of the 19th century and early uh, 20th century, talked about uh, some arrowheads and bones being found, but that was it. Uh, the chances would appear to be uh, remote. And then when I gave a talk in 2012, uh, again to uh, rural libraries and also to uh, St. Bridget's Church, uh, as part of the uh, uh, appeal for the uh, Charles Dawson Brown uh, Mu 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 Museum. Uh, I then started to talk about the work of, uh, of, of rural archaeology and how they'd started a systematic investigation uh, and has made some uh, promising uh, finds. So progress was being made. These finds were made, initial finds were made at, 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 at Stoughton, uh, believe it or not. And then uh, after that, well, we were working on this uh, this boat uh, under a car park in Mells, which is uh, uh, thought to be uh, possibly uh, Viking. I'm not going to go into that. So that's a separate story uh, altogether. But helping with the, uh, the boat project was uh, a, a group of former uh, police detectives who were absolutely uh, uh, fabulous. And I suggested to the people at Rural Archaeology that uh, you want to get these guys in, they're, uh, they're, 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 they're good. And that's exactly uh, what happened. And that core of uh, former police detectives uh, has grown and, 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 and grown. And uh, the uh, results have uh, been, uh, if I'm allowed to say, uh, quite uh, spectacular, uh, with over a thousand, not thousands of finds uh, they found uh, over the last few uh, years. Uh, not all uh, Viking, uh, not, and even then, not necessarily connected uh, with the uh, battle of, of, of Brunenburg, because Anglo-Saxon, if it was a battle, then Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, remains would have been found 
as uh, well. So a lot of finds uh, have been made, a lot of exciting uh, finds have been made and finds have been made all the time. I mean, uh, I got a, a text from Pete Jenkins, uh, one of the uh, police detectives uh, just a few days ago, so how excited that they found a, a, a dirham, an Abbasid dirham. This is uh, uh, from Arabia. And uh, the Vikings were the ones that used these uh, in uh, Northern Europe as a sort of, uh, of, of, of currency. So we find dirhams, that means that the Vikings have been uh, around. So this was found uh, last uh, last week. And other recent finds include this uh, arrowhead and this uh, whittled uh, and uh, knife, uh, adding to the uh, many other uh, exciting uh, finds. Uh, we can't say were uh, because uh, you know this is an archaeological site and uh, has to be uh, protected. All I can say was found in the in that uh, area I indicated in that red. Uh, red square, that red uh, rhomboid uh, uh, shape, uh, and loosely the uh, the Bebbington Heath uh, area. So it doesn't prove Brunebert because you know, the, the Vikings were there, we know that, and there was conflicts that were going on uh, all the time. But the sheer numbers of fines uh, coming through, uh, they need to be analysed, uh, um, we're involved with that. We're doing some uh, uh, isotope uh, analysis uh, with groups uh, in uh, Nottingham, uh, the British Geological Survey, and also groups in France uh, based on the uh, the iron artifacts. And that's going to be quite exciting. And there's a meeting next year, the Royal Society of Chemistry, uh, which uh, that will be presented. But it all depends on databases, what you're comparing with in order to be uh, uh, definitive. So uh, that's basically it, folks. And uh, again, very many apologies for the uh, the difficulties we had at the start. Difficulties, which means fading light. I'll just go and switch the light on. Okay. Now you can see me. So I'm just going to finish uh, uh, now. Uh, I've got a but, couple of questions I can ask you, Steve. Yeah. Uh, sure, just to finish by saying that Sorry, uh, do apologize. Put, all yeah. these, uh, put all these links on the uh, the chat uh, for people to uh, look at uh, later on. Uh, OK, so that's basically it. Uh, I'm sorry we've gone uh, over time, but uh, yeah, Di, I'm very happy to uh, answer. Okay. Just to conclude. Thanks, Steve. I don't know if these people are still in the chat and in, in, listen here, but if they are, um, Matthew Stockton, uh, he asked a question after the Norse Celtic uh, Celtic Alliance retreated in AD 937. Is there any evidence that they returned to Ireland? Because I thought they initially settled on the world after being thrown out of Dublin. Right. No, there's two things going on here. The, 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 the first wave of settlements happened in AD 902. OK, that's when Ingerman uh, was expelled uh, from Ireland and then settled in Wirral. This is some two generations before the uh, the Battle of Brunanburg. And then during that period, uh, the Viking settlements in, in Dublin around recovered. So uh, they became uh, populated by uh, the Vikings uh, again. So by the time of 937, there was a, a very strong army of Vikings which were able to come over to take on Athelstan. And they probably would have gone to, one of the reasons why they would have chosen uh, Wirral for a landing point, because you know, it's directly over the, uh, the Irish Sea, is because of the former uh, Norse settlers, although they've been integrated, they are more likely to provide a, a friendly uh, beachhead uh, for these new uh, marauders coming in. That's what we uh, believed. The big question is whether the Wirral Vikings, uh, again, again, would have been integrated with the English, would have uh, sided with the old uh, old kinfolk, or would they by then have uh, just kept their heads down? And so 
the people who were driven out were the uh, were the marauders basically, and uh, we believe that the uh, original uh, Viking settlers uh, uh, were left uh, largely or to some extent uh, on, uh, on, on, on molested. So I hope that answers your your, your, your question. OK, thank you. And just one more. Um, and, and this I think it was um, F. Nance asked, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but mir is a word meaning sandbank and an ing is a suffix meaning of belonging to. That leaves D, which was the name of the river, since before the Romans called, called their fort Diva. Wouldn't that make Dingsmere mean in effect the sands of D, which would be a good place to beach a fleet to, consistent with the location of your Tingsmere, if for a different reason? Yeah, that's a very good point. And that was the argument of uh, another another historian. Uh, stress, I'm not a historian, I'm a scientist, by the way, but another historian, uh, John McNeil Dodgson, when he was, he thought the D was, uh, was Dingsmere and had this, D Ings mere uh, formation as his explanation, just as you uh, as, as 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 you said. So he put this forward, I think, in the 19, uh, 1950s, but then later retracted it because uh, further analysis showed that that uh, uh, that couldn't be uh, the, the 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 case. So yeah, that has been considered, but. Uh, been considered now uh, un unlikely compared to the uh, the things mere uh, argument, but that's a you know very good point. Hope that's that answers your question. And just at the end, the last one, um, Mr. David Laverty has just said, "I'm a professional archaeologist. Can I help with this investigation? And what can I do?" Uh, in terms of the archaeology, yeah, yeah. Well, we can put you in contact with uh, rural uh, archaeology. Uh, straight away. So if you uh, drop me an email or drop just uh, if you've already said that on chat, then uh, we can uh, get in contact and, uh, and and put you in touch with the uh, with the the, the, the guys uh, the uh, and thanks very thanks very much for your offer of uh, offer of help. OK, thank you. OK, we need to sort of wind this up again now. So, Stephen, thank you very, very much indeed for your time and thank you for this evening. And again, thanks. Uh, I do apologise to all our audience for our bit of a teething trouble. It was our first go at doing this and I'm sure, you know, we'll we'll get it more slick next time. But it was it was great of you, Stephen. And thank you very much indeed for your time. And thank you for all for attending. Thank you. Thanks, Guy. And thanks, everybody.